of this question about science communication, how to make science understandable to people is one that uh, all technologically developing or developed societies are grappling with. I, I want to begin with a moment of caution. One should ask why, I mean, why are we so interested in making sure that people understand science? Is it a kind of brainwashing that we want to do? Or is it that one wants people to be curious about the world around them and to have the faculty to ask the right sorts of questions because it's a changing world and, and we want people to be educated citizens in it. And this is a kind of creativity that is important for societies and we want people to develop their faculties. I and mean, we ideally in a, in a robust society, we don't want people who have the capacity never to recognize that they have it, for instance. So there are, there are good reasons, but there are also bad reasons. The bad reasons are about brainwashing and making people susceptible to, to science. And you know, so I think that the, I mean, one should begin with the fact that children are naturally curious beings. And, you know, we, we often talk about the fact that kids ask very interesting questions to which the parents often don't have answers. The educational system, I think, often dulls that interest and that curiosity. There is a great deal that is known today about how to teach science. So it's engaging and encouraging and involving and not um, rote learning, memorizing, and you know something that makes people bored. So science education is a profession in and of itself. And I think it's not that I personally could add much there, but I want to say that one place where my field, science and technology studies, has interacted productively with science education is in showing that, that children learn things better if you show them the, the reasons for it. And the reasons can be shown in the classroom, but also not in the classroom. So one thing that we have as a very fortunate addition to our cultural system in Boston is a very big and important science museum. Uh, so there are these kinds of institutions like science museums or science programs on television or science sections in magazines or newspapers uh, that create a kind of ecology of science communication. This goes beyond just teaching scientists to talk, you know, in uh, an understandable way about their work. In universities today in America, there are courses that you can take. There's in at Harvard, there's an entire student organization of scientists that's called SITIN, which stands for Science in the News. So this is a group that the young science students themselves organized and put together. And a few years ago, there was a very enterprising person who was heading this SITIN group, and they created a series of little podcasts around topics of current interest. But this came from the students the provost's office had some little money that it made available, and but they put together the discussion and produced these things. So I think that once science communication becomes part of the culture, then you can also free up the intelligence and creativity of people themselves to find new ways of discussing these things, like this student group that I'm talking about at Harvard. And one shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that this all happens or has to happen from the top down. In many developing countries, uh, I'm particularly familiar with India because I'm Indian by origin, um, civil society groups are doing a lot of science and technology education because often the impacts of science and technology are not fully studied by the companies, by the private sector, and yet people experience those environmental impacts and economic impacts. And so civil society groups have often been at the forefront of generating new knowledge. So this has to be an all society, all the time kind of engagement, not I took one course in science communication in my first year of college, and then I forgot all about it. It has to be built into the 
sort of functional DNA of the society through these various mechanisms that I'm talking about. I guess the last thing I would say is that with all of these issues we've been discussing, to some degree, it's a matter of unlocking energy. It's not teaching people things or putting it into their heads or their hands. It's making people themselves adept, able, capable. And, you know, so it comes back to democracy. I mean, I am firmly convinced that if we do democracy well, we will also do science better. So the virtue of a democracy, such as openness, transparency, access, wide communication, deliberation. These are virtues that are also important for having a scientifically robust society. They're not different. It's not that science, good science sits aside and has a life of its own. The best science is in the societies that have cultivated cultivated the virtues of good societies in general. Mm-hmm.